Welcome to the fourth episode of Season 3 of the Ubuntu UK Podcast. It's Monday the 29th of March 2010, and in this episode we're going to talk to Simon Phipps about his new role at the Open Source Institute, we'll have a command line love, and we will course over the latest news, events, a bit about Ubuntu, and your feedback. I'm Alan, I'm having a bad evening. (laughs) With me this week is Laura. To make it worse. Hi. Hello. Hang on. Sorry, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I say hello to Laura. Hello, Tony. Hello. Get a room. <laughs> hello, Laura. Hello, Alan. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Uh, what have you been up to? Um, a surprising amount of blogging. Really? Yeah. What, a blog post? <laughs> no, three blog posts in one month. Oh, my life. Wow. So, and this yes. one of them, I, I um, actually, I caught my wife reading oh, last, yeah. n- last night. She liked it on Facebook. Well, when I say caught. <laughs> <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't, it wasn't illicit or anything. <laughs> well, no, it was about the... It was um, my Ada Love last day, wasn't no, it? No, no, it was the, oh. the thing you're wearing right now. Ah, my jumper. Yes. Ah, because she, she liked my Ada Love last one as well. Ah, okay. Yeah. You got a fan. Uh-huh. Excellent. Um, yeah, and the, the other one was um, geeky. <laughs> <laughs> so one crochet, one geeky. Yeah, um, that was on um, installing IBM software on Ubuntu when ah. it's not support. Well, it's unsupported software and how to do it. Cool. Which is quite cool. Was that mainly aimed at your other IBM t- uh, types? Mostly, yes, and helped by them on Twitter as well. Ah, okay, cool. We've also got Tony. Hi. Hello, Tony. Hello. That was me talking earlier. Excellent. <laughs> Hello. What have you been up to? Um... Not a huge amount. Um, oh, I, I know what I did. I did a. I made a poster in Inkscape. I had to do a poster of part of my coursework for the course I'm doing, and uh, I did it all in Inkscape, which is a, sort of the first major thing I really had to do in it. So I was using that. It, is Inkscape the right thing for doing posters? Um, it was the thing that occurred to me to use, <laughs> mainly because I, want, I knew I wanted to use some elements from SVG, um, other SVG files, things like Open Clip Art. So I, I took a couple of things from that, incorporated them into my design, and um, yeah, it was good. It worked. I, I passed. Excellent. Well, which is the important thing. And Simon. Hello. Hello. I'm back. Hey. Yes. Yay. I was at the theatre last time. Um, I'm sorry about that. Oh, you're trying to sound all cultured now <laughs> when we just said it's you were just not here. <laughs> you got a bluff. Chicken reinforce dance. the fact that actually I was at the theatre, don't you know? Sorry, I was at the cinema. <laughs> well done. When well, I'm not here, I'm stuck in traffic. <laughs> <laughs> or a snowdrift. <laughs> what have I you been up to? Uh, actually, uh, not too much until uh, this last week gone. Um, I'm a radio ham, don't you know? Mm. But I haven't, been on the, um, I haven't been on the air for years. Everything else has been sort of uh, taken over. It's However, all been packed away. It's all been packed away. All the radios are in a box in the roof. Can't be bothered. Too many cables, and uh, it really does get in the way. However, Joey Stanford blogged um, last week about come on, all you hams. We need to uh, get hold of all of the uh, amateur radio software in Ubuntu and give it some love. Yeah. And I thought, mm, ah. Now, I, I'm heavily into satellites, and there's some satellite software within Ubuntu. And um, it definitely needs some love. And you're the man to give it that love. <laughs> I'm hoping to be. Yeah, I've been doing a lot of uh, searching, digging, and um, sort of detective work as to how I might um, help out. And uh, that's looking good. good you should tell us about that in, in far more depth at a later date. Probably. Once you've that had a bit of a shut play. up, Simon. Was <laughs> no, 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 no. That was not. <laughs> it but felt like it. <laughs> I think. Uh, yeah, we could we could really go into some details about that because the only yeah, thing I know about Radio Hams is that Tony Hancock episode. Yeah, sure. In the sixties. So no, I think, no, no. Cool. This is really good. Right. Stuff. Okay. Like huge... <laughs> <laughs> uh, unless uh, uh, the only other thing, of course, is um, and I'm not going to steal your thunder. I hope, but um, he went to one music store. Is the other big thing. Oh, you've been playing with that? Yeah. You've been buying music? Yeah. Excellent. After I'd um, started off straight away, I'd been in it about a minute and uh, found a bug. Good. Which has been fixed. Uh, well, that's already. better than finding which, it after it's released. Which, mm. is, which is good. <laughs> and that's now available for any, everybody can take part in that beta. Everyone right? running loose. Everyone running yes. loose. And it's yeah. definitely worth it. Good. Cool. Now, last time we said we were going to introduce ourselves uh, each episode and uh, this time it's alan's turn alan i know the time has just said we've run out of time but you don't escape that easily <laughs> so tell us a little bit about who you are why you're sitting here in our front room uh oh okay um well uh i wasn't prepared for this <laughs> even though it says I my know. name in the thing <laughs> i did that oh, i didn't thanks. draw your attention to it i thought he'd catch you on the hop thanks um uh yeah so i'm um um someone who uses linux 
and I'm not a programmer and mm-hmm. I'm not especially super competent system administrator either. I'm really just a user and I talk about it a lot and blog about it a bit. And I know a bit about how to use the desktop, a little bit about how to use the server. And um, I came to be in your living room through Hampshire Lug, mm. I guess, originally. Mm-hmm. We met at a Lug meeting that I bought we my eight-month pregnant wife to. Yes. <laughs> it was her first Lug meeting and <laughs> last, <laughs> funny enough. But, um, yeah, I met you guys and then, um, yeah, became friends. And then we decided to do a podcast and that's why I'm here. So how can people find you on the internet? Uh, they can find me by typing Popey into whatever their search engine is <laughs> and they'll probably find it and that's popey p-o-p-e-y yes not Popeye not no. or anything like that no, or I extra o's no particular fancy <laughs> for olive oil at all right okay excellent okay well let's get on with it there's no dave here to say it sounds like a fun packed show i'm afraid so it's not going to be fun packed no In the news this week... The Creative Commons music store Magnatune has found the unlimited downloads membership scheme introduced two years ago so popular that it's moving away from shipping CDs and users paying per album. What does that mean? Basically, you have a subscription membership uh, which you can download as many tracks and albums and things as you like. Ooh. Um, they used to be able to ship CDs with music uh, on it, but they decided that actually people were just downloading FLAC and WAV versions and making their own, which is understandable. Yeah. Uh, and they used to be able to do a you know pay a certain amount per album. Now, you can still do that, but it's going to cost you $12 per album. So essentially, they're wanting people to kind of not do that anymore. Right. So there you go. Different change in model. And how much is it a month? I don't know. Oh, okay. A few bucks. Hot on the heels of the announcement that open source Nouveau Driver is making its way into the Linux kernel proper comes the news that NVIDIA has dropped support for their open source driver. NVIDIA recommend the binary only driver instead. Yeah, it's quite funny this. The way they the way they frame it is the NV driver is what people use to get going with mm. Linux and then they all migrate to the fantastic NVIDIA binary driver. If that's the way it's framed, and we now recommend that you use the Visa driver to install your Linux operating system, and then go to the NVIDIA binary driver. It's it's, it's mm. framed as if we know the NV driver is rubbish, but it's they're only there to get you up and running, and then you install the binary driver because people love the binary goodness. Well, they do if they want to get 3D. Yeah, yep. <laughs> yep. at the moment, sadly. The CIO of American uh, CNL Bank has suggested that users of its online banking service would be more secure using Ubuntu and Firefox than the family PC running Windows. They are even considering dishing out customised bootable CDs from branches. That's pretty cool. That is yeah. really cool. I, when I saw it, I was just, wow, that's just kind of thinking outside the box really, isn't it? And it also says something about Windows. If, the, if you know, a banking system sa- says to their customers... You know, what you're using is really unsafe. You really should not be using that. You should be using this other thing instead. I mean, they do talk about, you know, being the family computer. So. I assume they're sort of saying that even an Ubuntu CD distributed a few months ago with potentially any Firefox vulnerabilities in it is still more secure than Windows. Yeah. Right, fair yeah. enough. Well, they're on about making their own distribution, surely. I think yeah, it's Ubuntu with tweaks, so they were, they were going to set it as the bank's so the home page goes site to the, the home page, yeah. and then blocks every other bank <laughs> <laughs> and transfers all the money out of that bank and into this bank. I know. I read it; they were going to actually make their own distro, take everything off apart from what you need to bank the with. browser. So yeah. when you're going to get when you want to go oh, okay. and do your online banking, sling the CD in, reboot, do your banking, power down, take it out, and like crack a, on with your silly little Windows box, <laughs> like a kiosk. Yeah, essentially. The internet video service thing, Miro, have released version 3.0, promising to be faster, smoother, and louder. The project's also announced a new easy-to-use video converter for people baffled with the settings in every other video converter out there. Yes, it, look, it's a front-end to FFmpeg and all the other usual tools. But the video converter. The video converter yeah. is, yeah. So um, it's the same sort of things underneath, but if it's easy to use um, and presumably hides a lot of the settings away, then yeah. you know, fair enough. Yeah, absolutely. And Miro itself has always been given a bit of a kicking for being mm. slow to start. That's one of the things sluggish. they've they've really this, they've got like a fifty percent increase in startup speed or something. They say increase in startup speed. Uh, well, in, yeah, <laughs> decrease in startup speed, I suppose. Yes. So straight on to the events, the Southeast Linux Fest is still on. Yeah, indeed, it's June eleventh, twelfth, and thirteenth, and <laughs> um, we've got the promo to play. Again. That we've played already twice, but anyway, let's play it again. It's good. 
Join us for the 2010 Southeast Linux Fest as we once again celebrate Linux and open source software in the GNU slash South. Due to the overwhelming response last year, this year's event will be bigger, better, and longer. Self 2010 will take place Friday, June 11th through Sunday, June 13th at the Spartanburg Marriott at Renaissance Park in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Be there for UbuCon, Fedora Activity Day, BSDA Certification, Drupal Camp, multiple parties featuring Dual Core as well as the guys from Mystery Science Theater 3000 as Riff Tracks, and an even more expansive group of superb speakers, sponsors, and exhibitors. Self is free to attend, but hurry and register today to lock in the special discount room rate at the hotel. Register today at southeastlinuxfest.org. See, I said it was good. <laughs> <laughs> Europython is July 19th to the 24th in Birmingham, UK. You can find out more details at europython.eu. The third OS Bar Camp is coming up on April the 17th and is being held at IBM's Pembroke Street offices um, in Dublin. A biennial event to promote open source, OS Bar Camp is held in an unconference style with a broad range of talks and events covering the open source technology landscape, ranging from in-depth technical tutorials to project updates right on to introductory aspects of open source. The broad elements of the open source community will be on display. Find out more at osbarcamp.org. And that's being run by Laura Tchaikovsky, who's helping us run OGCamp. It must be fantastic then. Must be fantastic. We're just four and a half weeks away from Odd Camp, and Ooh. we're yet again teaming up with the Linux Outlaws to host a weekend of open source fun and frolics. And we're going to have a live recording of the podcast on Sunday. Yeah. Excellent idea. And Fab set up a fantastic site where you can offer talks and put up suggestions for things you'd like to see or hear at the event, or even during the actual podcast recording on the Sunday. Get along, ideas.ogcamp.org. Yeah, it's good. There's, um, there's Some already great a, ideas. Yeah, yeah, there's already a list of um, people who want to give a talk there. Yeah, or would like to see something give, given. Is it basically ideas.com.org is a it's a wiki basically. Yeah, it's an open, along open wiki. Open wiki. Go along there and stick your ideas on. Some some interesting ones there already. One about um, uh, the election and who geeks should be voting for, or at mm. least the different views of different parties. I think Alan Bell from uh, Tolk. Yep. The I Open Learning Centre. That's the one. That'll be a lovely and topical by then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As we say, yeah, week one week like, before the election. Absolutely. About four days or something, wasn't it? Good Lord, yeah. So come on then. If you've never been to anything like this before, why should you go? Um, because there'll be plenty of people there who are probably like-minded and also people there who are completely different-minded from you, but you might learn some interesting, cool things from them. My mum and dad are going to come. Oh, Brilliant. my life. Yeah. What are they going to talk about? I have no idea, but they're going to come and have worked out a way of getting into Liverpool and parking and everything special. I, hope they've got I haven't even done that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Why am I not surprised? I hope they've got some embarrassing baby photos of you or something they're going to bring along. I'll have time to sort out a presentation. Yeah. Mm. Um, of course, you don't have to do a presentation. No. You can just come along and take part. But the yeah. idea is you can get involved and help shape the event and make it what you want it to be. Yeah. One, of the, um, one of the interesting ways of getting involved, uh, and this is how I got into Log Radio, actually, is to volunteer for the crew. Oh, Even yeah. if you don't know anybody, it's absolutely the best way to get involved. Yeah. Definitely. Um, because you will most certainly become part of the team and get right into the guts of uh, the whole log camp. So uh, if you're on your own, uh, volunteer for the crew. Yeah, mm. definitely. They were a good bunch last year. Yeah, yeah. It, we oh, wouldn't have, we couldn't have done it without them. <laughs> yeah. We just sat back and let them organise it, and we just stood up. You know, we, were we like, just stood up, mouth watching everything. Yeah. <laughs> and we've got a great head of crew this year who's organising them all, so they'll be even more mm-hmm. militarily organised than yes. last time. <laughs> um, so if you, Anna will knock everyone into shape. <laughs> she will. I wouldn't argue with her. No. Um, so if you're interested in getting involved in being on the crew, you can email ogcamp at ubuntu uk dot org, and there will be some as yet to be confirmed perks. Yeah, I have no idea what that no, is. So we haven't really sorted that out It's not like we yet. know what the perks are, and no, <laughs> we no, haven't no. told you. We no, don't, we know, don't what know, know what they are. I should imagine they'll be in the lines of mugs or T-shirts or something like that. Mm-hmm. But, you, know. um, you can also join us in the hash OGCamp IRC channel on the Freenode network. We all tend to lurk in there. 
Indeed. Um, we have had a few people say, oh, I've had difficulty getting a hotel. Well, there are still plenty of hotels available. Um, Dan has updated the ogcamp.org website with details of where you can find uh, hotel rooms for, say, the three days if you're coming up on the Friday, so three nights. Um, so, yeah, don't let that get stop you uh, coming up there. There's some cheap deals as well. And you don't have to come up for all three days. If you're only nope. available on the Sunday or only on the Saturday, then come for either one. Absolutely. And um, don't forget, also, we've got the... Um, Concert, not really a concert. A uh, rat hole radio rat. show. <laughs> Sorry, a whole road show. It's a gig. Yes. It's a, yeah, gig. a gig. A gig. Concert. I'm sounding concert. really old and farty. Well, like Simon goes to the theatre. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying, but it's not working, is it? Um, with some very kind of free culture people in. Um, mm. Attila the stockbroker is the one that springs to my mind. Yep, yeah, and that you do have to buy a ticket There are for. tickets for that, yeah. I think yes. about five quid. But Mine arrived the other day. Really? Excellent. Yeah, with a little personalised note from Dan. Yes. It was really Aww. sweet. So did mine. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, and but you can. Sorry. sorry, I was say you can find out more about that on oldcamp.org as well. And there'll be some kind of party or something happening on the Saturday night. Yep. Will and I'm sure there'll be people around to have a drink and chat to and things on the Sunday. So mm. if you are only there for one day, you'll still get to chat to people. Hmm. It's on the 1st and 2nd of May 2010. We haven't mentioned that. And it is at the Black E in Liverpool. So uh, that's where we're headed. Um, we have some sponsors who make it all possible. Basically, they pay the bills. So we need to give them a good mention. Who have we got? Linux Format, who are a media partner again and have done us a fantastic ad in this latest issue of Linux Format. So go out yes, and buy it. Absolutely. It is. I'm holding it in my hand right now. And they've also put um, a, a subscription offer up on our website. Yes, you can get a really good discount. Yes. On that. So looking. if you go to the front page of our website... I'll it is worth subscribing over. again just to get <laughs> <a discount. laughs> Yep. So they're our media partner. Who else have we got, Laura? We've got the Open Learning Centre mm-hmm. and Linux Emporium, Opsview, yep. Bitfolk, and a new sponsor who's Recru- Recruit 12. Excellent. Okay. Well, you can find the Facebook group where you can declare you're coming along to the event if you're a Facebook user, and all the other details at ogcamp.org, and we will see you there. We're very pleased to have uh, in the studio uh, Simon Phipps, ex son and now OSI, uh, one of the OSI directors. Uh, welcome, Simon. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here so far from home. <laughs> <laughs> um, we should start off basically with an introduction for those people who don't know who you are, who I don't know who these people could be. Um, who are you and, and why should we care? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just this local guy in Southampton. That, yeah, we yeah. You, that you obviously up. had a down evening and needed a local guy. <laughs> um, so I, I, as you say, I've just finished... Um, Five years as the chief open source officer at Sun Microsystems. Um, In that time, I presided over the liberation of uh, Unix, of the Java platform, of uh, the Java server platform, um, of the Spark chip designs, um, of uh, what else? Well, pretty much everything, actually. (laughs) And uh, and I, I now feel very gratified to see that all of that code is free software, and it doesn't matter what change of strategy there might be in the company that f- follows on from Sun, mm-hmm. because it, all of the software freedoms are guaranteed in the steps that we took. And mm-hmm. some open source uh, acquisitions as well, things like MySQL, VirtualBox. Yeah, so we, we, we acquired, uh, uh, we're the first one that we acquired actually was um, Star Division. So we, oh, we, we acquired Wars, OpenOffice.org yeah. and yeah. Uh, liberated that. Uh, then we also acquired NetBeans. And liberated that, put, um, created uh, a free ID out of that. Um, then um, a number of other companies, VirtualBox, and then MySQL was the last one in the uh, in the line there. Mm. And so, fairly recently, you've moved on from uh, Sun Microsystems, and now um, you're doing other interesting things. Right. So uh, at the moment, I'm I'm making sure that I go down to St Cross House down in Southampton every two weeks and sign on. <laughs> and um, to uh-huh. fill the time in between sign-ons, I've uh, been elected as a member of the board of directors for the Open Source Initiative. So mm-hmm. I'm one of 10 directors there. I'm the new kid on the block, along with uh, a gentleman from Brazil and with Tony Wasserman, who runs uh, Carnegie Mellon West over in California. And so what do the OSI do and... and why should we care about them? So uh, OSI was founded in 1999 by a group of people who had just had experience of uh, Netscape um, going bu- going out of business and having to uh, do something with its web browser. With, with And they created the Mozilla Foundation out of that. Mm-hmm. That whole experience of persuading the executives at Netscape that they wanted to liberate their software 
persuaded a, a bunch of people over on the west coast of the US that there needed to be a new approach to explaining free software to business people. Because when you went to people like the executives at Netscape, if you led on an argument about software freedom, they would t typically look you in the eye and decide that you were a crackpot. Because of the word free? Uh, because it, well, not just because of the word free, but because you had led on something that was about personal freedom rather than led on something that was about business value. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so these, th this group of people realized that all of the things that made Netscape want to open source Mozilla um, were business factors that derived from software freedom. And so they decided that it would be better, to, rather than leading with software freedom as the idea, to lead with the benefits that you get from software freedom. Right. And so the open source ideal and the open source initiative is like a is, 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 it's kind of like a shadow gram. You know, you hold your hands up to the light bulb and you see the picture on the wall, and uh, OSI is the shadow on the wall from software freedom in the in the spotlight, and that ideal of um, putting software freedom ideas into practical pragmatic form that business leaders can adopt because they have business value has proven to be a brilliant move because today uh, open source has won you know every software business out there has got open source somewhere in their business strategy in most cases somewhere near the middle of their business strategy and osi is the group of people that are the stewards of the open source definition that says what an open source license looks like and of the open source service mark, which is the little green uh, uh, open, uh, open O uh, that people use to represent their open source credentials. And people seem to be using that um, open source quite a lot, and it seems it comes up for a bit of abuse. Well, um, it, it's, the thing about open source as a term is that um, uh, because it is such a strong uh, brand, because it has such strong associations to people, uh, lots of people have tried to appropriate it. Mm -hmm. um, so lots of corporations, for example, have tr described themselves as open source when in actual fact they don't have software freedom as their priority. Um, one of the things the OSI board has to do at regular intervals is say to people, you're not open source because, well, look, you don't, you don't actually comply with these clauses in the open source definition. Is there, an, is there anything that could actually stop them from saying they're open source? Um, on the whole, what will stop people saying they're open source is the reason that they want to describe themselves as open source is because they know that a whole lot of community energy comes from doing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what OSI does is it mobilizes the community to, uh, to uh, reject the abuse of the term. So uh, there is, it, it, again, it's, it, there isn't a direct causality. It's not that OSI can say we're going to sue you, mm. but OSI yeah. can say, well, I'm sorry, but the way you're using open source there is not right. And um, the OSI board uh, asserts that you should not be calling your product open source. And in every case that we've done that so far, the company involved has, has, has backed down. So would the o OSI actually go as far as telling people don't get involved with the this product or this company or the community around it? Um, I think we would have to be because because OSI is a California corporation and they have laws over there that um, <laughs> that, that we haven't quite got here yet. Although we will have soon, um, uh, we have to be very cautious about right. taking that sort of action. But we can state facts clearly. We can state that although company ABC says that their product is open source, its license does not actually comply with the open source definition, and OSI would not have authorized it had it been asked for an opinion. So that's about as far as we'd go. We probably wouldn't engage in a, in, a, in a verbal attack because when you do that, you are inviting litigation and they've mm. got lots more money than we have. <laughs> Fair enough. And I, I, I don't think I'm alone in, in noticing there's been a bit of an upsurge in discussion around the OSI, probably mostly since you've become one of the directors. Um, <laughs> does that mean there's been not a lot of activity over the past few years and now it's ramping up or is there some change in the way the osi is working what's what's changing in the osi now so well it, it isn't just about me joining what's been happening at osi is that there has been a, a something of a, of a, a hiatus in its activity over the, the the middle of the decade and um the osi board members have realized that the future of the osi does need securing um, OSI, although it gets uh, denounced fairly frequently by some parts of our community, 
Um, ISI plays a really important role in free software because um, a lot of procuring organizations, such as governments and big corporations, reference the open source definition as their benchmark for what free software is. And because of that, the stewardship of the open source definition is a, a crucial element in free software going forward into the future. And if we want to secure software freedom, we have to make sure that OSI doesn't um, become derelict. Mm. So uh, those of us who are on the board at the moment believe that it's very important to build a secure future for OSI. Um, one of the initiatives that we've got going is an attempt to work out how to make OSI be a member organization. Up until now, it's been a, 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 a kind of an oligarchy. It's been a, a, a board that elects its successors. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, for one, am very keen to turn OSI into an organization where the board is elected by people who are passionate about free software around the world. So I'd like to see Linux user groups and um, BSD user groups and uh, software groups around the world affiliate with OSI and be in a relationship where their members could then become electors of the board. So that the future of OSI is anchored not on our luck at recruiting board members, but mm -hmm. rather on a, a very broad base of people who understand what, what software freedom is about. And the details of that haven't been worked out yet, but I guess... Was... So we're, we're a reasonable way down the road in our discussions on the board, and uh, the next step is going to be to um, to crystallise that discussion into a, 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 a proposed membership scheme, and then we, we will go public with that and encourage public debate about it. But are you definitely looking at group memberships rather than individual memberships? Uh, we're, we're actually think looking at group memberships and individual memberships. Oh, okay. Um, because the, the, you know, there are a lot of people who would like to be OSI members. We, the, we get mm. an email on the board uh, mailing, mailing address. OSI at opensource.org gets email pretty much every day from people wanting to be members. And we don't have any way to, for them to be members at the moment. Right. So the, one of the things we will do is create an individual membership scheme. But uh, also, um, open source is very important to a lot of um, community groups. It's also very important to a lot of corporations. Mm. So we may well have a class of membership that allows corporations to become members of OSI. But we're very, uh, very wary indeed about selling influence like that yeah. uh, we, we, we want to be able to hear their voice but we want them to realize that software freedom is the thing that matters not um uh, business success with open source speaking of corporations there was recently um an announcement put out um by yourselves about or taking aim at the bbc relating to uh, some drm that they're planning on implementing can you tell us a little bit about how what the osi stand on that and what that's all about right i can um so the BBC are uh, encouraging the, or they're requesting Ofcom in the UK to permit them to put a, a broadcast flag on BBC digital broadcasts so that only devices that uh, can verifiably handle that broadcast flag are able to view the digital broadcasts. This is just the idea that was, uh, that was shouted down in America, being brought back out of hiding again huh. and implemented in the UK. It's just as bad an idea over here as it was there. And the uh, driver is to, to restrict what you can do with content that's delivered to your home. Absolutely. So the idea is that, that, uh, that you, you, know, you won't be able to uh, use your Freeview box if the, Freeview, if the manufacturer hasn't subscribed to the, the rules of how you handle the broadcast flag. And th then what the BBC is proposing doing is putting the management of that, uh, the, those rules out to a, 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 an organisation that's actually outside the UK um, that will govern the rules for who can uh, have which broadcast bit set in which flag and what you can do with it. So the BBC is proposing two really bad things. One of them, they're proposing to make sure that you have to uh, respect the broadcast flag on digital broadcasts. And that's death to Myth TV. To Myth TV. Mm -hmm. That means that no more ability for free software to be used in devices that interpret TV broadcasts. Unless we ignore the broadcast flag? Well, you or? won't be able to because the signal will be encrypted. And the only way you'll be able to decrypt it will be if you're party to the secret. And you'll only be able to be party to the secret if you promise in a, in a suable way to uh, respect the, the, uh, the, the broadcast flag. Mm. So Presumably. the first bad thing is the DRM, and the second bad thing is putting all of the rules of the management of that in the hands of people who have no accountability to the license pair. And the OSI have 
spoken out against this. So OSI, uh, uh, with many other organisations, so if you, if you go look at the letter, Open Rights Group has got a page about this, um, and uh, they've put a, 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 a position paper up. OSI signed up alongside the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, we've stood shoulder to shoulder with the Free Software Foundation, with uh, Quadrature du Net in France have signed up to it, and you'll see there's a whole list of organisations there, because we believe that the erosion of software freedom anywhere in the world is harmful. But the erosion of software freedom in this specific case is very bad because the BBC's content is respected and consumed throughout the world. And if the BBC start demanding DRM, then it will naturally follow, even in places like the US that have rejected the broadcast flag, you can see the, in, the inexorable consequence will be DRM there as well. So w we believe it's really important to stand up and uh, say, no, we don't want this to happen. And we have a very narrow window of opportunity to talk about it. Um, it really, if, if anyone wants to do anything about this, they've got to do it before uh, Easter. Uh, they need oh, to wow. write to Ofcom and express their views in their own words about why they do not want to see that DRM there. Uh, mm. There's instructions up on the Open Rights Group's website. So presumably this is not just a case of waiting for another DVD John type character to come along and, and crack this encryption. It's going to be tougher to do than that. And, and, and all the time it hasn't happened, we won't be able to watch TV on our myth boxes. Well, th th that, that's the practical consequence. But much more sinister is this is part of a whole fabric of legislation. Right. So um, at the moment, uh, you would probably be able to have a DVD, DVD John type person um, reverse engineer the algorithm, hack or crack the key, and get everyone watching TV again for a few weeks before the, uh, mm. the offshore organization changes, moves all the bits around so you can't right. do it anymore. But before long, we're going to see um, the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement, this uh, secretive agreement that's being negotiated outside the, the visibility and scope of any of our democratic processes, uh, putting a mandate in place to make that sort of activity illegal in every country in Europe. And so there won't be anywhere for DVD John to live because he won't be able to live in America because of DMCA. Mm. He won't be able to live in Europe because of what ACTA has forced every member country to, put to, to instantiate. And so what we'll see will be a chilling effect on software freedom, which will be that although we may all believe in it, most of us will not want to have the digital Stasi waiting at the door for us every time we go out. And it's quite real, that digital Stasi. You know, they, 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 they will pick you up at Heathrow and, uh, and uh, uh, lock you up. Or you, you'll go on holiday to, uh, over to the US and you'll find that you'll hear the snap of rubber gloves as you go through JFK. <laughs> but not in a nice way. Not in a nice way. Um, um, do, you, do you think it's a real you know, realistic proposition that people will just find it too scary or too hard or too risky to get involved in open source and think, oh, I'll just go and buy Windows and buy Mac OS and stick Office on it? Well, I think there's two dynamics there. One of them is the sort of um, seductive dynamic of, of the Mac, Mac operating system. Uh, and, you know, so I, I, I've raised my hand. You know, I have, I've got Macs at home. And the reason I have Macs at home is because my family have found they work. Mm. And there are many people around the world who would rather have a working computer than freedom and a non-working computer. Mm. Um, so uh, there's, that, there's that dimension. The other dimension is indeed the dimension that says, well, well, you know, I could get that Linux operating system. But if I do, I won't be able to watch DVDs. I won't be able to listen to music. I won't be able to watch TV. I won't be able to use the, any of the websites that have news and views and media and downloads. Why would I want to live like that? I'll just go and get a copy of Windows. And, so it sucks. You know, at least I'll be able to watch TV. And there's yeah. lots of people who'll take that view. Yeah. And I think that the, our ability as a fr software freedom community will gradually be eroded. So uh, it's really important that people take action about this uh, in, the, in the near future because we have three attacks on our liberties coming up. It, specifically in the UK, we've got this, this uh, DRM on the BBC broadcasts. Mm. The second one is the Digital Economy Bill, yep. which is being um, uh, it, it brushed through Parliament in a disgraceful way at the moment. And then the reason these things are all happening is they are the, they're the fruiting bodies. You know, you, know how you go out and you see the, the fairy circle on the lawn with the mushrooms all around it. Mm. And after a while, you realize that the reason all the mushrooms are in a circle is in the middle of the circle, there is a filthy great fungus. And you can't see the fungus. You can just see the mushrooms. The mushrooms are the fruiting bodies, and the fungus is hidden and growing in the dark. Well, um, Digital Economy Bill is the fruiting body for ACTA. ACTA is a... A, a, a dark fungus growing in secret and um that's it, we'll see more legislation coming from it because it, it it's going to bring in um 
uh, border seizures of equipment. It's going to bring in uh, ISPs being required to filter content. It's going to bring in uh, a DMCA-like uh, rule uh, preventing circumvention measures. They're all going to arise from ACTA. What are the specifics that we should be concerned about in the UK? We'll, we'll come to the ACTA in a minute, but what are the specifics of, because that's you know, very immediate for us. So, so the Digital Economy Bill, people are focused on the, um, the, the, the download rules. You know, the idea that if you download things you shouldn't have done too many times, you'll get cut off from the internet. Mm-hmm. The so-called three strikes. So, three strikes or graduated response, depending on oh, how, right, how okay. emotive you're feeling. <laughs> And um, it, I, I'm very happy to call that a really bad idea because mm-hmm. I think it's entirely disproportionate to disconnect a citizen from what is becoming the means of democracy mm-hmm. simply because an allegation has been made against their children. So and that, that's one of the issues is, that, is some would argue, well, these people who you know, hog the bandwidth and who illegally share um, – Co- uh, copyrighted content or stuff they're not licensed to, to share shouldn't they be disconnected shouldn't something be done about these people who are you know yeah nefarious in Pro- some probably way probably should and, be and and is this not an appropriate tool to to do that no it's not and and why is that <laughs> what's, so, what's so it's it's all about proportionality it's that the view that you should disconnect people for unauthorized downloads comes from a a set of misthinking about uh, cop- copyright ownership Uh, You can see that the framers of the Digital Economy Bill have been very heavily influenced by lobbyists from places like the the BPI, the British Phonographic uh, Institute, Mm. and uh, and, and other media organisations into believing that uh, people who do unauthorised downloads, first of all, are guilty when when accused, Mm -hmm. secondly, uh, are always bad people, and thirdly, that the only reason to be on the internet is to do these things. Okay, so the digital economy bill has got this mindset that says the only reason people get on the internet is to use uh, rich media, and if you abuse it, you should be cut off. Right now, if that is your worldview, then that's probably fair. But the truth is that um, just last week, Gordon Brown invested thirty million pounds in a new web te- web science institute at Southampton University, just down the road from here. And the reason he did that was because he said that every citizen should be should have high speed broadband and had a right to be on the internet so they could participate in democracy. So with his right hand, he's encouraging every citizen to be connected yeah. to digital democracy, and with his left hand, he's saying that your democratic rights are only worth as much as an MP3 download. Mm. And th- that's the issue there. It's a matter of pro- it's not it's not saying that it's great that people download things that they shouldn't. I, it's 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 I despise the idea that people people should download things that, that they should have paid money for. It's not actually theft, but it isn't honest. Mm. Um, but th- then to say, and as a result of you doing that, you should no longer have the ability to uh, pay your taxes online. You should no longer be able to get, retax your car. You shouldn't be able to register for unemployment benefit. You shouldn't be able to uh, check the, the, uh, the, the electoral register. You shouldn't be able to get council services. You shouldn't be able to pay your credit card bills, do your banking. You shouldn't be able to join in with the Open University. Uh, you know, it's just disproportionate to mm. disconnect people for something which is a civil matter between a media rights holder and an individual. Mm. It should There should be something done about it, mm. but not this. Right. Isn't that the key, though, the fact that it is a civil matter? I mean, if I drive my car and I do something wrong four times and I get caught uh, speeding or whatever, I lose the ability to drive my car. It still doesn't stop me going to those places. I just have to find other ways of, of getting there. If I had my internet disconnected, I still could pay my credit card bill, but I'd have to do it by post. Well, but this is more than that. This is, um, this is like uh, you were caught speeding three times in your car, and now your wife and your family are unable to drive as well. Hmm. Uh, because they took your car away and uh, they've made sure that no one in your family can drive now. And by the way, they didn't actually take you to court. They just said they thought that they saw you speeding. Yeah. Mm. Uh, see, it, it, this is the difficulty in discussing it is there, there is a clear moral case to make mm. that there's bad things happening. But people then instantly jump to a conclusion that isn't justified by the evidence. Mm. But that actually is not the problem with the digital economy bill. The problem with the digital economy bill is that it... Uh, It creates a set of rules that give special privileges to a set of business models that date from the 20th century rather than from the future. And 
I don't believe that our elected representatives have had time to actually consider whether it's right to be doing that because the bill has only been discussed in the House of Lords. Uh, the people who've discussed it clearly didn't know what they were, what they were looking at if you look at them, the amendments they made. Mm. And there's now been no full debate in the House of Commons. There's been no committee stage. What's going to happen is that on the day after Easter Monday, on April the 6th, it's going to go for a, uh, a second reading in the House and chances are that Gordon Brown is going to announce the election that day. And what will immediately happen is the digital economy bill will be pushed into the wash-up process, where instead of being debated, uh, its acceptance is discussed in secret by the front bench uh, spokespeople. So, uh, and, and I believe that what's gone on here is actually intentional. You know, I believe that, that uh, Lord Mandelson, uh, the divine Peter, has... <laughs> Uh, intentionally put this bill at this stage in the life of Parliament so that there can be the minimum scrutiny of the measures because he doesn't want MPs to get educated about it. Is uh, it because it, there, there are technically difficult bits in it that makes it hard for MPs to to scrutinise it properly? Or yes, is it, absolutely. Are they just you know, complacent and they do this with everything? Well, it's not they're complacent. It's that MPs have to, have to look at a lot of issues. So you know, take Southampton again. You know, my local MP is Alan Whitehead. Um, Alan is is very strong on environmental issues, and he he's got a, a lot of knowledge about environmental issues. He's got a good academic background. He used to be a professor at the uh, at the, the at the institute. Um, he's not stupid. He's not bad, but he's not an expert on digital matters. And but he's my representative. Mm. So what he and other MPs like him do is they say to the civil service, "Tell me what I should think and justify it." And the civil service builds a case. If, they, if it's a, a, an industry case, they'll often go to industry lobbyists who will say to them, here's how you should, here's how you should put it. Mm. And if you look at the digital economy bill, the, the truth about it is that it's really bad advice for, for MPs because it's been influenced almost exclusively by um, people who want to pay Cliff Richard's pension rather <laughs> than by people who want to guarantee that free software advocates are able to continue to change the world or that the future entrepreneurs with new business models are able to have successful businesses. And MPs need to have explained to them that it's not about letting naughty kids download MP3 files, Mm. that it is about having proper scrutiny for legislation, which just like the DMCA in America, will be abused to prop up businesses that ought to be going out of business, but aren't because the law has given them an extra leg up. Mm. And we, we mustn't allow our, our MPs to just let the bill be shooed through and wash up. I think we really need people to write to their MPs about it in the next few days. And, and what's, the best way, what's the best thing for them to do? Is there some easy mechanism for you know, letting your MP know what, what should we be telling them? Right. Well, th- th- you know, in, it, we're very lucky in the UK We've got a website called writetothem.com. Uh, and if you visit writetothem.com, you type your postcode into a box on the page. It finds out who your MP is and it knows his email address or his fax machine number or his postal address and what he responds to because they gather statistics from the results. And you type your letter into the web page, click the button. Uh, they send you an email to validate that you that it's really you, hmm. and then they send the communication to the MP for you. Gets there within a few minutes, and uh, for the more switched on MEPs, uh, MPs, you get a reply straight back. For the less switched on ones, like unfortunately my my MP, takes about ten to eleven days to get a paper reply back through the mail. Mm-hmm. But you really can get straight to your MP and tell them the things you want them to know. You don't have to write a great big long learned diatribe about all this. You don't have to write an essay. You really can just write a, a message that says, uh, I'm very concerned that the digital economy bill is going to have a big impact on Britain's future innovation and competitiveness. And I believe there should be a full debate in the House of Parliament. Please, will you make sure that happens? Mm. Signed, me. Mm. That's all you have to say. Now, you can put a full case in if you want to. The longer you make the letter, the more likely it is that you'll get a form reply yeah. from your MP mm. uh, because they won't re- read past the first paragraph yeah. and they'll just send you the letter that they send to all the people who are saying that pirates should be allowed to download videos. Right. Hmm. So is it worth really um, customising the letter or should you just use a, a form? Because there are form letters out there that people like 38 Degrees campaign are asking you to send yeah. to MPs on this sort of thing. So, so the, the benefit of the 38 Degrees campaign, and, uh, you know, maybe we should put up uh, some links for people yeah, we'll do to that. use. Uh, you've, uh, I'll put up, certainly put up a posting on my blog afterwards. I'm on webmink.com. 
Um, 38 Degrees has got the advantage that they keep statistics on how many people have responded to their campaigns. It has the disadvantage that it encourages you to use the same words everybody else does. Yeah. And it doesn't send you a copy of the letter. Mm. Uh, write to them.com is fantastic. They send you a copy of the letter. Uh, they follow up about two weeks later with an email to ask you if your MP responded so they can get re- gather statistics on which MPs are being responsive and how fast they are. Uh, I would say that if you've, if, you, if you've got the ability to be articulate, use writetothem.com. Um, if, you, if really it's just that bit too much effort, please do use the 38 Degrees site and send one of their standard emails. It has less impact because mm-hmm. the, um, the, what happens is the MPs just make a stack of all the ones that say the same things and say, right. hey, look, there's 100 people here who hold the same opinion. Uh, but if you send something that expresses the truth about you, that says it from your perspective, you say, you know, I am a, an entrepreneur using free software and I'm very worried that free software will become much harder to develop if the digital economy bill is allowed to fall into the hands of the BPI. Mm. Or you can say I'm a student and I'm very worried that, um, that the actions of the people around me in my hall are going to make my university hall be cut off the internet and that's just not fair. Mm. Uh, say, say, what, say how it is for you, say it succinctly and you'll have a far bigger impact on your MP. Now, you implied there that the digital economy bill stuff was linked to ACTA, this sort of trade agreement, uh, international. What impact will that have on uh, everybody else? We've got listeners outside the UK as well. What sort of impact will ACTA have on them? Well, um, so uh, to give a little bit of background on ACTA, ACTA stands for the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement. It was started a number of years ago as a, uh, a, 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 a privately negotiated trade agreement outside the scope of the World Trade Organization or the World Intellectual Property Organization, WTO and WIPO. The reason it's outside the scope of those organizations is the, um, the big, powerful governments had noticed that third world governments now had a voice at, uh, at WIPO and WTO, and they felt they wouldn't be able to steamroller through uh, rigorous, uh, regressive rules about the handling of uh, digital media and about uh, uh, trademark counterfeiting and a number of other things. They were worried that, for example, these third world countries would say, uh, we need generic drugs as fast as possible. Our people are dying of AIDS. Yeah. So no, we won't sign up for a, a, a drug counterfeiting treaty. Mm-hmm. So what they did was they, they, they created a new venue to negotiate this treaty. It's a secret venue. Um, so you you only get to be a member of the of the club. It's just like Fight Club. You know the first rule is you don't talk about actor. Um, and uh, it's taken three years for us to get a full leak of the of the of the draft document. It came out about uh, uh, two weeks ago. You'll find it. It's actually up on Pirate Bay if you want to go there, or you'll find it in a number of other places. And th- what this treaty does is it gathers together a bag of all of the rules around um, patents, trademarks, copyright, the, the, all those things that are deceptively called intellectual property to uh, things like counterfeiting together. handbags so it's it's all, all about making stuff. sure that louis vuitton handbags are really louis vuitton handbags right it's all about making sure that when you buy a copy of michael jackson's dvd it was that the royalties go to the copyright holder of michael jackson's dvd um the the, the chapter that's about internet things is just a subsidiary part and much of what actor talks about is actually fair enough mm. You know, it's it's fair enough that people who are making bulk um, rip off products shouldn't be allowed to import them into countries pretending they're the real thing Mm. and possibly endangering people's life and health. Yeah, Um, it's fair enough to enforce all. You know, the reason we have trademarks is because trademarks give you confidence that the thing is real. Yeah. So uh, uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Uh, however, whenever you create a secret venue like this and then invite people with a vested interest, if you don't invite all the vested interests, what will happen is the agenda will gradually skew further and further and further in the direction of the interests that are represented. Mm. And ACTA has become very skewed indeed in the direction of uh, rights holders, both digital and pharmaceutical rights holders. And so uh, there are two important groups of people who think that it's a big problem uh, having ACTA waved through. One of them are people who are concerned about third world pharmaceuticals uh, and want to allow generic drugs to be made as soon as possible so that lives can be saved in third world countries that can't afford to pay high, high royalty fees. And the second group of people are people who are interested in digital freedom. 
for people who believe that if you uh, are regressive about access to knowledge, access to the internet and access to technology, that we won't see the innovation that has driven the amazing pace of the 21st century into being, being able to be sustained. What kind of restrictions are we talking about here? The same kind of things that are in the digital economy bill or well, well, the f- more the- so or... The, the, the first problem you have in talking about this, of course, is that because it's been secret for so long, most of what we know about it has been based on speculation. Mm. And it's only been in the last two weeks that we've actually seen the draft bill. When you look at the draft bill, you discover that there is very little agreement amongst the, even the negotiators at the moment <laughs> about how it should be and what the clauses should be. So the, the problem areas in ACTA are um, – uh, there, there is a problem area around – putting the responsibility for what's on networks into the hands of internet service providers. So um, internet service providers will become responsible for the things that are on their networks. And the result of making them responsible for what's on their networks will be that uh, they will have to start filtering. They will have to put in place controls over who can have access because if they don't have those controls in place they will then become liable for the misbehavior that happens on their networks uh, it's it's what it's what, what what i term an erosion of common carrier status uh, so that that's that's one of the aspects um there, there's actually a, a really good summary of actor up on the website for le quadrature de net um, La Quadrature de Net is a, uh, a digital liberties organization f- uh, based in France, and okay. they have a great three, three clause summary for ACTA. The really big problem with ACTA is that all the things that it does uh, have been tried before in other legislatures and have been kicked out. Right. So one of the things that's in there is the criminalization of uh, trademark and copyright infringement. Okay. So at the moment, it's a civil matter. You, get, you can get, get sued, sued and yeah. fined. Right. But uh, ACTA wants to see it become a criminal matter so that you can be imprisoned for breaching copyright and okay. breaching patent rights and breaching trademarks. Um, and now that was, a, that was a part of the European Union's uh, – a, 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 a bill in the European Union called IP Red 2, the intellectual property – I can't remember what it stands for. Uh, IP Red <laughs> 2, which was around in a, uh, uh, about two years ago, 2007, and uh, got – suspended by the european parliament because it was far far too extreme right well what's happened is the european negotiators in these secret negotiations have been pushing all of these rejected clauses of ip red 2 into acta and then what's going to happen is when the negotiations at acta are finished there'll be this finished 50 page treaty and national governments will be given a a binary decision do you want to adopt it and ratify it or do you want to reject it and become a pariah who doesn't get any more episodes of House? And uh, you can see legislators looking at this and saying to themselves, well, you know, we don't, there's a lot of things in this bill we don't like because we didn't like them the first time they came around. Mm. But if we reject it, our citizens won't vote for us next time. So, well, we better adopt it, hadn't we? But it only works if lots of people adopt it. I well, mean, there's certain key players, if they didn't adopt it, it wouldn't be a, a, a valid proposition. That's true. Unfortunately, the keyest of the key players are the people pushing the, whose governments are pushing actors. Right. So they are the UK. Uh, actually, not the UK. They are uh, the European Commission. Right. They are the European, the uh, United States Trade Representative. Right. Uh, and a couple of others. Um, the, the best chance we have with ACTA, though, is for uh, the European Parliament to decide that what's going on is disgraceful. So right. while any one government will find themselves unable to say no to a ratifying actor, mm. a block of, say, 26 countries is going to find it something that is, is, is that where they can unite together and say, no, we don't like it. Right. Now, it just so happens the European Parliament are not very happy about the European Commission engaging in secret negotiations without involving them. Yeah. There was a, uh, if, you, if, you're, if, if you're a sad watcher of European legislation <laughs> like I am, you have seen a, a thing go through the European Parliament recently called, on the SWIFT agreement. SWIFT is how banks transfer money backwards and forwards across international boundaries. Right. And SWIFT 3 required an international treaty that was going to let the Americans see all of our bank transactions over here in the nice. UK. <laughs> and the European, the European Commission had said, look, first, that's what we've got to do if we want to be modern guys. Mm. And the European Parliament said, by no means, and voted SWIFT 3 down uh, by uh, a, a two-to-one vote in the uh, European Parliament. 
And um, uh, so we know the European Parliament doesn't like secret negotiations. It does not like fait accompli. It does not like the European Commission negotiating things that they've been told not to. And so a really valuable action that listeners throughout Europe can take is to write to their MEP and say that they think that ACTA needs to be brought into the, into the, 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 the full glare of daylight. Right. Mm. And uh, th- we can ask our MEPs to sign up for a written declaration that's on the table in the European Parliament at the moment that sets parameters by which ACTA will be acceptable. And is there a, is there a deadline for our MEPs to sign that? Or? Yeah, it's coming up really soon. So if you're listening right. now... Uh, after you've, if, if you're in the UK, the first thing that you want to do is send a letter to your MP about the digital economy bill. If you're not in the UK, the first thing you want to do is write to your MEP about the written declaration about ACTA, which is on the table in the European Parliament. And unfortunately, writing to your MEP if you're outside the UK is a, is a harder job because uh, the write to them.com doesn't cover people who are outside the UK. But it does cover those who are in the UK and want to write to their MEP it does. as well as their MP. Yes. Right. So okay. that write to them.com will let you write to your local councillor. It will let you write to your MP. It will oh, write, right. let, let you write to your MEP. And are there other organisations that we should be um, supporting who are um, active in this area? Yes. So uh, in the UK, UK, we've got the Open Rights Group. Uh, the Open Rights Group is running campaigns on each of the th- three things that we've been talking about this evening. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, if you're in France, La Quadriture du Net is a, a good thing to, to support. Uh, you can get information about um, ACTA from two really good sources. There is an organization called Knowledge Ecology International, or KEI. And uh, KEI's website has got lots of good information about ACTA. They've been receiving lots of surreptitious leaks recently, and they've, there's been some really good information coming out. There's also a Canadian professor called Michael Geist, who has a, a truly excellent website about ACTA, uh, that it's well worth adding it to your, your, um, your feed reader so that you can see uh, what he's finding out. And if you look at either of those things, they usually will give pointers to the places where activ- activism is being coordinated. Then finally, there's a thing called the Transatlantic Consumer Dialogue, which is a, an, a, an organization being formed by concerned politicians in Europe. Uh, it's been set up by, in particular by David Hammerstein, who was a, a Spanish MEP in the last parliament. And he has got lots of good insider information and pointers about what's going on. Fantastic. Excellent. Um, one final thing is that you're coming to talk at Og Camp, I understand. I've heard that rumour. <laughs> Please tell me it's true. because It's a true rumour. It <laughs> we, we've been I, telling everyone. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm planning to come to Og Camp. We'll Excellent. see where all this stuff has got to. Mm. Um, I will be talking about uh, software freedom and uh, the imperative of protecting software freedom in practical real terms rather than worrying about being whether we're from the uh, the what is it the Gnudian the Gnudian people's front or the people's front of Gnudia that's easy for you to say <laughs> And it will be probably a week away from the general election Less by that than point. That, by Less then. than that, yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's going to be pretty close. It's by then it will be a great time to be asking your MP really rather pointed questions yes. about uh, why they didn't uh, uh, oppose the digital economy bill. Which mm. you, so, sorry, I, I should be more positive, shouldn't I? <laughs> uh, asking them how they feel about the 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 uh, the, the uh, uh, digital economy bill being put on ice. Yes, <laughs> and, and presumably the candidates as well, not just the incumbents. Actually, so I wrote to uh, my Conservative and my Lib Dem candidate for my constituency this afternoon asking them what their view was on the digital economy bill uh, one of the big problems with the digital economy bill is it's going into wash up in parliament you know he could be blocked by the conservatives and the lib dems if their front bench spokespeople had any balls mm. but unfortunately in particularly in the lib dems you know you see that it's actually the conference that has the balls and the the, the front bench spokesmen don't think that the digital economy bill matters very much mm. Mm. so just to wrap up, what are, what are you going to be doing with your time then now that you're signing on every couple of weeks and well, running the – or not running the OSI, but contributing to the running of the OSI? Um, so, well, I've, I'm, I've got a blog that I'm uh, okay. writing on every day. Um, mm-hmm. I'm uh, doing open source consulting. Uh, I'm very interested in making sure that OSI um, it has a positive future that promotes software freedom for all of us. Um, I'm very interested in as long as um, uh, politicians remember what I used to do for a living, uh, going and trying to use that influence to change things over in Brussels and in, uh, in Parliament. And uh, I'm also going to be growing vegetables. That's Excellent. one of the things I'll be doing as the spring comes on. And you're a bit of a photographer as well, is it? I right? have been known to take photographs. Uh, I sell my photographs, in actual fact. Yeah, right. and, uh, so I need to take some new ones as spring is coming on now. <laughs> and I listen to music a lot. So I put up, uh, I put up free music pics every Sunday up on my blog. Ah, right. Excellent. Cool. 
Well, thank you very much indeed for coming along and talking to us. I suspect we could talk for another hour yet, but, uh, you know... Time Over beer in long. Liverpool, maybe. Yes, that absolutely. Well, we'll Thanks. see you in Odd Camp, then. Absolutely. Thanks very much. We've got some command line love, haven't we, Simon? Yeah. Ooh. Something slightly different. Oh, we may have to, uh, have to uh, rename the segment. To Gerald? No. <laughs> oh. uh, to, uh, there's a script for that. Ah. ah I just like that. Uh, we thought about that in the pub uh, whilst uh, drinking. <laughs> whilst drinking, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> whilst preparing for the show. Oh, I was only drinking cake, fine. whilst doing show prep. Right. I, um, I don't wait for uh, Ubuntu to tell me when the packets, um, packages need updating. Right. I, you sit there and repeatedly I, run I, apt get update. All the well, time. I don't. I use aptitude. So I do sudo uh, aptitude yeah, yeah. update and sudo aptitude dist upgrade. Mm-hmm. Okay. That takes a long time. So I thought, well, hang on a minute. Why not just put that into a little script and so i type uh, one short word which i um use sort so s-o-r-t I type okay. in sort enter and it just does all that stuff empty password and it cracks on so that's it it's nothing spectacular but it's very very simple and that's of course what script should be about making things uh, easier so it automatically applies all the updates yeah you know, not just downloads them it applies them to the system absolutely okay what happens if there's a question because sometimes Basically, the package when it gets to the question, it'll sit there and, I'll, and wait for you to ah, answer right, the question. Okay. All right. So all the script does, and it's not really a script, it's just a, <laughs> a quick way of... Concatenation of, of two commands. <laughs> in, indeed. But I type four characters, enter, done, instead of, you know, 20. You're of, so lazy. But it's a quick and easy way into scripts. So we'll put it on the site, and okay. um, hopefully you can all have a play with it and uh, get back to us and tell us what you think. And if you break your system, don't blame Simon. <laughs> Yeah, and if the uh, the command that Simon has created called sort conflicts with an internal command called sort on your system, then, um, yeah. Well, you call it whatever you like. Yeah, absolutely. And I've not got into the um, details of where you should put it, where you might want to put it. Maybe we'll cover that some other time. Cool. It's time for the... Gerald. <laughs> I nearly swore. Time for the bit about Ubuntu, and the first item is URL to follow. Alan, can you explain this some more? Uh, no, right. you didn't want to put that. Oh, okay. You don't want to say that. You don't want to say that. That's that's just, I don't have the URL to put in the Ah, notes. I see what you've you done see. there. Okay. So it's about the Ubuntu Manual Project, which is after help getting screenshots of Ubuntu Lucid before 10.04 is released. Yeah, Benjamin Humphreys um, has um, steered a project, the Ubuntu Manual Project, to create a, a PDF, printable PDF, mm. um, for beginners and um, one of the things they need to do is get loads of screenshots but they can't do that until the GUI has been finalized and then they've got a huge amount of screenshots to take in not very much time not much time in lots of different languages Ah, of course yeah they're they're localizing it yeah they want to talk to Anna Nelson really Ah, yeah and her uh, documents automated documentation project Mm -hmm. it hooks the docs into the build process so they automatically generates Updated screenshots every time there's a build. Oh, or wow. however often you run it. Wow. It's, it looks fantastic. She used it for her thesis and she presented about it at Osbar, Osbar Camp last yeah. September. I, I, she also right. talked a bit about it in the yes. interview we did outside the toilets at a pub. In- <laughs> <laughs> what they, what, <laughs> I remember that. What they've done is they've created an application called QuickShot and they've respun the Ubuntu CD mm-hmm. so that people who want to contribute can boot from this live CD and go through and take all these screenshots using this quick shot tool that takes all the right screenshots of the right size and does all that kind of oh, stuff. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, That's look, pretty good as well. Yeah, it looks quite okay, So we're going to stick a link in the show notes if people we will. are willing to get involved? Yes, absolutely. Excellent. David Siegel uh, blogged about uh, removing more buttons from GNOME. Yeah, it's got too many as it is. <laughs> Some people think that we're going too far with GNOME and making it too simple and, you know, dumbing down a bit. One but, of the things people do say is that, you know, the, if the ideal GNOME desktop would be one big button that said, do this and make everything work for me. Yes. And that sounds good to me. <laughs> Seriously, if it did what I wanted. Yeah, right, but what do you right. want? What do you what you want? Nah, well, let's not get into this again. Yeah. At least we've got Laura on the <laughs> on a microphone before we start trying just, to was, fumble around using my time. idea of usability. Just say, is. <laughs> if you're happy to spend that long making your desktop look sexy from Debian, then you're happy enough to spend the time going from a really simple Ubuntu into a more horrible Ubuntu to whatever suits you. So I don't see why anybody ever complains because they always have to customize. Yeah. In, in this particular example, he's talking about removing some duplicated or redundant parts of the, the GNOME file browser. It does yes. look clean. The, the, it does. Second, yeah. the second screenshot on his blog post looks really nice. 
the idea of being to free up more space for actual, you know, Although content. It actually looks like the window manager has crashed and gone away. <laughs> and it's lost the title behind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and to be fair... It is a mock-up, it, isn't it? Well, I, it's either a mock-up, but the window decoration is different anyway, so... Yes. It, it, the, the content is different, but also the, de- the decorations are different, which they wouldn't necessarily be. But it does look nicer. I mean, as you say, there's more space for content and yeah. less duplication of things. Um, but yeah, we'll put a link to that again in the show notes where you can find out more about uh, that little tweak. Do you know if that's going to be making its way into, into Lucid? No. No. So that'll be... Is that you don't know? Well, no par- it's... partly because it says that I am using GNOME Global Menu, and that's definitely not going to be in Lucid. Right, okay. Ah, right, yes, of course. The no, the men, uh, one that appears at the top. OS ten menu. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah uh, allegedly. <laughs> Okie doke, what's up next? Steve Kemp blogged about... Um, well, it's quite a long blog post, and I'm not quite <laughs> certain how to summarise it. Um, but it's basically about everybody arguing constantly, I think. It's, it's, it's partly that, but it's partly also about the types of people who are now joining in the argument. Mm. Whereas previously it might have been a heated debate between two developers about what's the right strategy for resolving a bug. Now it's a load of non-developers, possibly non-contributors, jumping in and saying, well, I think the buttons should be over here, and no, the bike shed should be blue. And you know, <laughs> and that's a partly a byproduct of Ubuntu being popular. Successful. Yeah. So this might be people who, who don't use Ubuntu or just... No, no, people who people use, use Ubuntu. Ubuntu and feel passionate about... It being you know, a good usable system. Yeah. and maybe, Should they not be able to say what they think? I'm not saying they shouldn't. Okay. No. I'm just saying there are more of them now <laughs> than there were I'll before. I'll say no. I'll say no. They shouldn't. Why? Well, no, they should. Well, we encourage they, them they to, to and we tell them they can't use it unless they report bugs. And then we tell them they can't report bugs because they're only users. Okay. I almost blogged about this, but my passion went away from it. But this might get it back again. <laughs> Everybody has to understand where they sit. No, we're all users. That's, this is reminding me of a right. certain sketch. I look up to him <laughs> and I look down to him. <laughs> yeah, okay. My Take the mickey, but it's absolutely true. And to be perfectly honest, that's what Mark Shuttleworth said at the end. Great, you can sit there and you can all debate, but at the end of the day, somebody's going to make a, deci- a decision. If you don't like it, then you have to accept it because the decision has been made. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I agree with that, but I don't, I don't necessarily agree that... I, I, no, I don't agree with what Laura said. I don't think that nobody you shouldn't have your say. Yes, you can have your say. But I didn't say that. No, no, no. But you you implied <laughs> oh, you were asking if I yeah. and I don't. I, I think that people should have their say, but I don't think they should necessarily turn a bug report into a mailing list post or yeah. a forum. It's, it's a bug problem. report, not a not a method of discussion. But then that's not a culture that if they're just users, they're not going to be used to bug reports and things. Oh, absolutely. Oh. It, you know, a bit of education there, and, and that actually leads on to um, the next one of our um, oh, items, yes. <laughs> which is that um, Mark Shuttleworth has posted on one of the celebrity uh, bug reports. Oh, that one. Okay. Yeah, uh, 532633. Yeah, the, yeah, no, another one. You know yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah. It's about the buttons. I've got it tattooed on my knuckles. <laughs> <laughs> um, about asking people to just calm down because the the bug has gone crazy and lots of people have commented with their opinion of the buttons. And so, is it about time that he or uh, the community sort of managed everybody's expectations? And it comes back to what I said about understanding where you sit. Everybody has the right and absolutely should be able to voice their opinion. But because you can voice your opinion, doesn't mean you can actually have any effect. And if nobody listens to you or nobody comments, you shouldn't go off in a rage. Well, there's no reason for going off in a rage on a bug report in any way. Really? <laughs> well, you know, in, a, in an ideal world, no. I agree. It's great that people are that passionate about you know, Ubuntu. But they should realise that um, they may not actually be able to change the world. Well, never mind all this what side of the buttons on let's get down to the really important ubuntu story of the last couple of weeks i think the thing that will uh shake the uh, the distribution to its very core um and this is that the default units are going to be changing in 1010 from the uh, iec standard of base 2 units for file sizes to the system international si standard of base 10 units oh really yes <laughs> What do you mean? Why that voice? I don't understand. Because <laughs> it's incredibly nerdy and your average user doesn't care. All they care is that, boom, 
the disc I bought is 500 megabytes, but it doesn't look like 500 megabytes. Yeah. It looks like 450 or something. Yeah, exactly. Where are their 50 megabytes gone? Well, this will tell you. Basically, they're going from the <laughs> technically correct but rep- represented, um, confusingly, KIB system, you know, where you've got little I's in between. Kibby it, bytes. Kibby bytes. To the uh, kilobytes being 1,000 bytes. Mm-hmm. It will be an option for those who, you know, feel the hatred for hard drive <laughs> manufacturers who don't print their stats properly. Um, you can switch th- to the full uh, IEC standard if mm-hmm. you really want to. But that's not in Lucid. This is changing. No, this is in 10, later. 10. It's a proposal. It's a proposal. That yes. it may be changed later. Yes. So. Other operating systems do things differently. Absolutely. And wrongly. <laughs> Did somebody say Dumbuntu? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Well, if that's the case, then you go, you, you go to Nautilus, click on a disc, and it should say about 500 gig, about half a terabyte. I'd like that. Well, Dave always that's says... Like he, fuzzy clock, yeah, isn't Dave it? Dave always <laughs> says he misses the fuzzy clock from yeah, KDE, yeah, yeah. right? Because the fuzzy clock says, oh, it's afternoon. Or, or um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's about lunchtime. <laughs> it's after two. Yeah. That might explain why he hasn't arrived yet. For the recording time. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all in the bit about Ubuntu this time. Time for your feedback. We've had a lot this time around. Um, we do read it all, but please, um, you know, the shorter the message, the more likely it is to be read out. Um, so let's get it over and done with. Let's do the buttons first. <laughs> get it over and done with. Oh, I see. <laughs> yes. I thought you meant the, feed, get the no, feedback no, 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 over no. and done with. I meant quite specifically the button-related feedback. Um, obviously, we have interviewed our anchor in the last episode, uh, and J.M. Peng wrote in to say... I loved your interview with Avenka Magic. As a member of the Mac Fallin development team, as a docs writer, I knew about the debate on which side the buttons should be on. I have them on the right because I think the buttons are more readily accessible there. But I also loved hearing about why the 100 Papercuts project was started. The Ubuntu UK podcast is the best podcast I've ever heard. This is true. Yes, (laughs) We didn't put that in. No, no, no. no. Uh, Thanks for giving me such a great way to keep informed about what's going on with my distro. Oh, well, thank you for that. That's a really nice, nice comment, comment yeah, isn't it? Very, yeah. very kind. Oh, we should appreciate it. that. Soren left us a series of messages on the website, but the main point was... I think having the buttons on the left is brilliant. I know it's really annoying to get used to it, but once you do, you realise that most of your activity in a window is concentrated toward the upper left corner anyway. So having the buttons on the right is a really bad idea, since you always have to move away from where you concentrate your mouse movements to minimise or close a window. I don't think we should get into that discussion. <laughs> <laughs> really oh, that's interesting. It's keyboard well, shortcuts you know. for the win. Yeah. Okay, you one, one word out. answer. <laughs> one word answer, left or right. I don't mind. Ambivalent. Thank you. Uh, neither do I. <laughs> I've noticed the two of us fail to give one word answers. <laughs> yeah. Only Laura's the clever one over there who managed to come up with ambivalent. Yeah, there's well a bit done. of pressure there. Yeah. Andy Piper piped up on our website. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he's going <laughs> to love that. Yeah, because taking the Mickey is just Ubuntu and GNOME specifically has been heading towards a Mac look for a long time. No, Ooh, really? there are many mods. Sorry, there are many nods to the direct copies of OS X user interface. I see this being a GNOME design trend as much as an Ubuntu and Canonical one. Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. Yes. Uh, we have some feedback basically saying that um, they disagreed with uh, Avanka's opinion that Ubuntu isn't heading down a Mac OS X look and feel mm. type route. In fact, a few people have commented on that celebrity bug report that, why can't you see it? <laughs> Are you blind? Are you stupid? Can't you see it? You're turning into OS X. It's like, well, Are we? Oh, so? really? yeah. Okay, fair enough. Um, after our voicemail we had last time, or just a moment, Hannah P tells us that Ubuntu is even boyfriend friendly. My boyfriend who hates the command line has been quite happy using Ubuntu for three years now, and I think he's used command line once when I forced him to. (laughs) Unfortunately, Ubuntu is a bit too straightforward for my lady brains, so I'm using one of its offspring, Crunchbang. Lady brains. (laughs) (laughs) I keep Simon happy, you're a Crunchbang. I haven't used Crunchbang for a long time. Although... It's too much yeah, for his lady there's, brands. There's been a, a big change with Crunchbang. Yeah, oh, right. it's switched to Debian, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it's gone to oh, Debian. Right. Mm. We'll have words with Phil at uh, Ogcamp. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. a good interview to set up, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, um, Mark Johnson commented on our website that... Further to the command line, love, if you accidentally type a command that you meant to run as root without sudo in front of it, you can then rerun it as root by typing sudo exclamation mark exclamation mark. Brilliant Ooh. tip. I used that yesterday. Really? Yeah, yeah. Wicked. Oh, it works. It's cool. Well, what you should do is just not forget to put sudo in front of it in the first place. Or switch to root and run everything as root. That's yes, a good that's idea. That's a good idea. 
No, it isn't actually. Please don't anybody do that. <laughs> Why not? It's a great idea. No. Run your entire desktop as root. <sighs> Pendulum pointed out that you could have come away with the impression that the EPUB ebook format was always protected by DRM. Yeah, Tony. Tony. <laughs> and that isn't the case, and there are non DRM'd ebook EPUB books out there. Yeah. There are. And I knew that because I have downloaded them and tried them with the Cooler book. Um, but it was not explicitly clear within the context of the review that that is the case. So definitely you can get non DRM'd EPUB books, but not, you know, good ones. I think we've got that now. Yes. Clear as mud. Last time round, we asked why some people listen to the show but don't use Ubuntu, and Ross Anderson replied to say, If sounds don't work, printers don't work, wireless doesn't work, etc., you will never get mass acceptance of Ubuntu. It's just not as simple uh, to use as Windows, even though it is better, faster, more stable, safer, etc. I do know about the software center, Synaptic, and what is so wrong with googling something and clicking on the download button and then expecting it to work i suggest you buy a brand new laptop and get somebody who already uses a windows box and is not a geek and challenge them to put a copy of uh, ubuntu 910 from the web install the software use a webcam print a picture and play an mp3 file without help from you guys i'm not sure what the value of that challenge is yeah i can see I i can see how you could you could go through that as a test to say whether it's easy to download Ubuntu, whether it's easy to set up a webcam as, as a set of individual steps. Hmm. But who does that? Most most people who are introduced hmm. to Ubuntu get it on a Linux magazine or they get given to given it to them or they hear about it somewhere. I don't know. I understand. He's basically saying yeah. it should, if, if it's as simple as we all suggest that it is, it should Prove just it. work. Yeah. But the fact is, I don't use Mac. But when I walk into the Mac shop, it takes me time to find out what you know, what everything is, how it all works, yeah. every single time I go back in there. So, you know, that's just using a new OS. My mum, last week, on her very first time using a computer, played <laughs> played Solitaire. This is Mumbuntu. Mumbuntu. Played Solitaire. <laughs> the very next time she was using a, a Ubuntu, she was cropping images and removing red eye from photos. Wow. And those are only the two times she's ever used a computer. That's brilliant. As for Googling something and clicking on the download link and expecting it to work... Would you do that with Windows? Yes, would you, you would, just, but that's, the, but that's no. the bad practice you get from Windows. Yeah, well, no, 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 that was more to the point that the people he's talking about wouldn't do that. Wouldn't do what? Wouldn't install Windows on a laptop. No, 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 he's, no I'm the, talking he's, about the Googling he's talking about. We're talking about how we reckon Ubuntu is so much easier because we have Synaptic and the oh, Software right, Center, yeah. and he's saying um, Windows users will generally just Google for an application, find a download link, click it, and what we generally advocate is you don't do that on Ubuntu because we've got this software center and, and you, know, you get updates and all that kind of malarkey. And what's yeah. so bad about clicking on a link on a website? Well, in fact, That's anybody cool. could produce it and it could have anything in it. Yeah, but Windows users have been doing that for years. Yeah. So it's no different for them than clicking on a piece of malware for Windows as opposed to a piece of, yeah. clicking on a piece of malware on Ubuntu. Or just not very well produced where. Just that there isn't much of that. Right, yeah, I suppose so. We also heard on the subject of people who listen to the show but say they'll never use Ubuntu from, oh crikey, I can't pronounce that name. Mani Merak. Thank you. I also like the podcast and will never use Ubuntu, but just because I like my cutting edge Arch Linux system and KDE better. Never had any luck with Kubuntu. The cast comes off as way more mature than the other open source Linux <laughs> podcast I've tried listening to. And I've listened to a lot of rubbish out there. <laughs> Nicely edited there. Yeah. Just call me an old bloke. <laughs> an old bloke. That's very kind of you <laughs> to say. Basically. Thank you very much. Very, yes, very nice. Thank you for the comment. And finally, Zan Gornak from Slovenia emailed. I've started listening to the podcast a week ago, and I've listened to almost all episodes while working on my website. Weirdly enough, I've listened to the episodes in reverse order, from newest to oldest. God, that was painful. <laughs> I've no idea why. In the past, I used to play... <laughs> <laughs> no idea why either. I, don't think I can't compliment that. <laughs> not sure we can help you with that. Uh, uh, In the past, I used to play many games, and that used to be the only reason why I didn't use Linux full-time. But now that I only listen to music and write code, I'm planning on switching to Ubuntu 10.04 full-time when it's released in April. P.S. I've attached a sound file with me saying my name, because I noticed you had problems pronouncing some strange names. (laughs) Much appreciated. do not... Oh, I did just I hope I got it right, then. So, uh, very much... Thank you very much for that email from... Shan. Which I've just pronounced perfectly. And that's all your feedback. Thanks for listening. It was a good show, I thought. Yeah. Really interesting interview. 
Yeah, I'm inspired to right back to my MP now. Yeah, you better get on with it. We're giving some homework to do. Mm. <laughs> um, I just want to mention a quick congratulations to Selexius on the IRC channel for spotting what was new in the last episode. What was that? What Nobody was here has noticed. Oh, was it something? Oh, oh, oh. An audio I know, I know. thing? Yeah. You said you were going to put a new piece of music in. I can't remember what the <sighs> name is. Yeah. Bed? A new, the no, no, no. A new sting. Sting. A new sting appeared. Nobody here noticed it. I know well, you selected it. you don't listen to it. <laughs> 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 okay. Anyway, you can find out how to get in touch with us on our website at podcast.ubuntu-uk.org where we've got our voicemail number, Twitter, our identity feeds, IRC channel, and a whole load of other stuff on there. Thanks for listening. See you next time. See you in a couple of weeks. Bye. Bye-bye.